Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, and today I've got a special guest based on an article that popped out. And as soon as I saw it uh, hit the pages of EP Monthly, I was I thought I got to I got to get them on. Of course, Jamie's easy to get on here because we're texting like almost every day anyway. Uh, but uh, two authors of that paper are here with me today uh, for the podcast. So John Holstein, as well as Jamie Shoemaker. Shoemaker's been on the podcast with us before. In fact, a couple times this year because of the conferences we've done at a couple of different places. So I uh, wanted to dive on that, really get a State of the Union on where we are with the reimbursement, with the new documentation and coding changes, as well as some of the numbers and things that we can that we see and they talked about uh, within that article. So uh, I think everybody knows uh, Dr. Shoemaker. So we'll let uh, John tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Dr. Stanton and Jamie. It's, a, again, a pleasure to be on this with you. Uh, Personally, I've been in the uh, started my career in the emergency medicine space and the revenue cycle space specific, specifically 37 years ago. Uh, have a strong passion for the specialty. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I've always been passionate about what you do and have a great deal of admiration. Uh, I've basically focused my career uh, up to this point in the, with hopefully being an advocate for the specialty and. Uh, and at some level, a, a source of information and uh, insight. And John is a uh, Philly uh, resident, so he, we've got uh, ASEP 23 will be in his backyard this year. And I mentioned home game earlier as we were prepping and uh, reminded me tonight that, it, we taped, that we're taping this on a Thursday, uh, that tonight is Thursday night football in Philly. You said against the, against the, the, Vikings. the Vikings. Okay. So uh, you got some action going on there. We'll be up in your backyard here in a few weeks. Um, so yeah. great to have you here on the podcast and appreciate it. Jamie, I'm going to bounce to you to give us a little breakdown on the article, uh, where kind of the impetus of the article, and, and then John, I'll get your thoughts on it as well and, and kind of the content. that We'll use that as our launch point. All right. I appreciate it, Ryan. Great to be back on Frontline. As we all know, in emergency medicine, um, our reimbursement has been under, under assault for quite some time. The erosion of our reimbursement, we continue to see the fights we have annually uh, with the physician fee schedule and Medicare adjustments. We know we are, our, unfortunately, our schedules aren't adjusted to inflation, so we continue to see declines. And uh, the data shows that from when we started looking at this data with the creation of the RBRVS, which is the, the AMA uh, area that does valuation, we've lost about 53% of our revenue based on inflation because we're not indexed to that, which, as we all know, is a big fight for us. But, you know, as I look around the, the scope of emergency medicine, we have a lot of issues dealing with boarding, scope creep, uh, you know, with uh, contractual issues, private equity, corporate practice of medicine. But when I look at all of the issues, I think the biggest boogeyman in all of our specialty is the healthcare insurer and what they are doing to uh, erode and take away our compensation for the quality that we do. I've said it once and I'll say it again, we're the best value in medicine. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, we're the very best, the first 15 minutes of the undifferentiated patient. Uh, we are trained as, we, you know, we are resuscitation specialists and we do the very best that we can in those moments of need. As this article pointed out, and John's been on this for quite some time, he's very astute. Uh, we keep getting the lower acuity patients siphoned off the top. And so now we're becoming essentially critical care uh, centers where all of our patients are complicated. No longer is it pneumonia, but I'm also on an LVAD or I've had a kidney transplant or I'm immunocompromised. Um, the lower acuity patients are being siphoned off because they're being forced to make a decision. Am I sick enough for the ER or should I go to the urgent care? Well, for a while we saw that happening. It wasn't a huge issue, but now it's happening more and more. Um, and now the copays are different uh, for urgent care versus emergency medicine coming to the ER to see us. And as we all know, 90% of urgent and non-urgent uh, complaints overlap. And so patients are uh, making some poor choices because they're going to where they can go to make it affordable for themselves. And as we pointed out in the article, oftentimes now health insurance is really catastrophic insurance because of the cost of co-pays, premiums, and deductibles. You need to be north of $20,000 in expenses before you can start seeing a nickel back in reimbursement for them covering you uh, for your insurer. So as John will talk about, you know, we have a new uh, self-pay patient that we address in the article. Well, I, I agree, uh, Jamie. I you know, there, there's the history of the uh, attacks, if you will, on emergency medicine by the insurance industry are very long standing and there's constantly creative. I mean, if you look at, we alluded to it in the article, the prudent layperson definition of an emergency, which in theory protects the patient approaching the emergency department uh, 
but now what you have is the insurance companies, uh, instead of necessarily outright denying, then they'll downcode the service and then challenge you effectively to 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 appeal it, uh, which just prolongs the process. Uh, I agree again on the low acuity patients, and I, I I think I believe there is a huge potential impact, potentially catastrophic impact on the specialty if there's continued loss of the lower acuity patients. And, and I think it's incredibly strategic. I think it's purposeful. Uh, and I think it is brilliant to use a word how the, the retail giants are now uh, basically, I believe, reconfiguring the primary care network in this country. Uh, so you have patients going to these retail outlets some of whom uh, would have gone, at least some percentage of them would have gone to the emergency department historically, and they're, it's being made more and more attractive for them to go not only financially, but from a scheduling standpoint. Uh, but it's not just that creep, I believe. You, you also have some of these organizations uh, and insurers getting involved to redirect some of the patients with comorbid comorbidities uh, some of them are strategically now targeting the Medicare Advantage programs. And certainly those patients would, are, in theory, at least higher acuity. But if they are maneuvered to other centers, there will be an increasing loss of volume to the, in the emergency departments. I, I similarly agree, and I think that Jamie was one of our conclusions that uh, in the not too distant future, the emergency department might be effectively a, a critical care department. To me, it feels like we, you know, and it feels like, especially now that we went through COVID, that every patient, as Jamie, you alluded to, is, is sicker and sicker. Um, as you mentioned, just so many comorbidities, so many other things out there. You know, we have the, the insurance companies that with this vertical integration of basically trying to buy or own, the, you know, the entire healthcare continuum. Uh, insurance is for profit. Um, you know, unless it's the government base, and then it's about trying to save money and not spend more money and balance budgets, and which never balance, but, you know, all those different types of things. And we're caught in the middle in the squeeze. And though Intala does protect the patients and protect some of what we do, clearly they're taking advantage of it. And, you know, you feel, it feels like we're in this constant, with the, in the emergency department, is a, is, a fortif is a fortification. And insurance is constantly just trying to push at the walls and, and breach the walls and kind of find new ways in and get away with it until they're pushed back out and then they'll try again somewhere else. So there's this constant game that they're doing to hold on to more of their money, shift more of the cost to the patient and refuse payments to the physician in order to boost those, the, the bottom line. Um, you know, and, and you know, it's paid off with record profits year over year over year for these insurance companies. Um, and it's, in, it's incredibly frustrating. Of course, now we're dealing with the NSA and, and how they're manipulating that, um, just refusing to pay things, even after the NS, you know, the, um, with the NSA, when you go and you challenge and like, yeah, you're right, emergency medicine, this is what you get owed. And they're like, well, we decided we're not going to pay that. We're just, we're just not going to pay. Um, and so these games are constantly going on and yet they're huge. They got a lot of money. They have a lot of lawyers. They have a lot of lobbyists, I'm sure. Um, and it, it's just this endless game that I feel like we're fighting where we spend as much time fighting for fair reimbursement as we are taking care of these sick patients that continue to come uh, to our emergency department. So, you know, it, it's never ending battles. And I know Jamie, you and I on the, uh, with the ASAP board side deal with that so often. Um, kind of get into that, that a little bit. And I know you had some thoughts as well, the responses to John um, with regard to that continuing tightening uh, of this belt that is almost feels like it's cutting off the oxygen supply to our legs. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great analogy. You know, here the reality is that you know the best part of our jobs is that we get to take care of everyone, regardless of economic background, their demographic. Doesn't matter. When they come across our threshold, we take care of them. Amtala is both a blessing and a curse, and we know that. Uh, what in the past we were able to subsidize those no pay or very uh, no pay patients with those with commercial insurance, but those rates are getting driven down. And as we allude to in the article, we're talking about now multiples of Medicare, but it used to be many multiples of Medicare for the blue, like Anthem and, uh, you know, Cigna and others, but that's not the case any longer. 
And the reality is, is that, as I mentioned earlier, our safety net is frayed. Right? We're at a tipping point because at what point do we no longer have a financial solvency where we can continue doing what we're doing? You know, it's very frustrating I, when I talk to others about this, you know, I would never think, like currently I have some people here fixing my deck. I had some rot, rotted wood I had to take care of. I would never dream of having them come do the work and then not paying them because, you know, some loophole or because I didn't feel that it was as complicated as they said it was. I would never have a plumber come to my home and fix my toilet and then not pay him because I didn't think it was to the level that he thought. But that's exactly what they're doing to us. And so as we talk about these insurers, some of them are de- veering away now from when they have the diagnosis list and things where they just automatically don't pay. That's more of a Medicaid issue now, but it's still there. But at the end of the day, when we provide quality care, and again, we are the best value in medicine, and I think we need to do a better job as a specialty about educating our patients about our pro fees versus the facility fees, because when they get a bill, it's astronomical. Um, I'm sorry, but when I take care of you and do suturing, it might be a couple hundred dollars. There should not be a $3,000 facility fee for me to take care of you and give you sutures, but that's what our patients are seeing. It's really, it's really unbelievable. But as we see more and more patients, and we call it the clinical theft, which I agree with wholeheartedly going to, you know, the CVS or the Walgreens or Minute Clinic, um, or even the urgent care is established by our hospital systems that we're not part of that. It's taking away care of those patients that we can see quickly, take care of expertly, and make sure that there's not something more emergent going on, um, and get those collections. Because at the end of the day, uh, healthcare is a business, and it takes money to run the business. Um, and we continue to see this erosion. Um, and so we'll talk more in a little bit about the new documentation guidelines and the changes we're seeing there. Uh, but, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's multi-pronged now. And so it's, it's really to head, hard to get ahead of ourselves. Ryan, you talked about the NSA and the independent dispute process, and we've been successful in federal court. However, as your group even knows, you litigate something, you win, and then they're holding our funds. And we don't really know what the mechanism there is to get them to release those funds. And for small independent groups, that could be uh, the straw that makes the back, but they, they don't have solvency and they have to close their doors. And so it's very, very frustrating. It's also scary. We're we are approaching, as we talk about, there's there are threats here. We need to address them. Well, I, you know, I think both of you hit on something that I think is really powerful and really important today, and that is the, the self the emergency department self pay patient today is fundamentally different than that patient was not that long ago, a few years ago. And what I mean there is that historically. The self-pay pay, everyone knew there was a some percentage of patients that simply were not going to pay. And maybe you ended up sending them a collection and maybe you got $10 a visit for, for, for those, from those patients after they went to collection. So it was less than $10 because you paid the collection agency a, a huge fee. You still have those patients. However, you have today's self-pay patient includes a huge category of patient to high deductible patient. And Jamie, you alluded to it. This is the patient who is n- may never get to the point of meeting their deductible so because it's the deductible is so high. So they've never they may never meet the deductible, which means you're the practice, the group is never going to see a payment from the insurance company. Hence you have to engage those patients. You have to engage them quickly. You have to have, be armed with technological tools to, as the industry is continually referencing, engage the patient using their preferred mode, mode of communication, whether it's text, whether it's email, whether it's phone calls. Some still prefer a patient statement. Uh, you, you actually, even with Medicare patients, uh, who may, let's say the insurance information was not supplied by the hospital and you have a patient, a Medicare patient with an outstanding secondary balance. Uh, you find all sorts of things in engaging these patients. And that kind of a Medicare patient may literally engage with you via a text, but then they're going to pay through the lock, sending a check through the lockbox. But you've got all these nuances and stretches uh, that you have to keep being innovative, engaging these patients, there's more and more of them. And the other part about that is you not only with the high deductible patients, but the Medicaid redeterminations as we're exiting out of, continue to exit out of COVID. In my view, historically, you could pretty much depend on the payer mix being stable in emergency department practices. But you can't really depend on that today because you've got this constant influx 
of self-pay patients who insurance, insurance coverage may or may not ever come into play. You've got patients who uh, during COVID were on Medicaid and now may have lost that coverage. So you've got to chase those patients. There are continually business challenges to keep the practices solvent. And you have to be continually creative in terms of engaging today's patients. Yeah, and one other part to that, John, that, that's really crippling us is, as you may or may not be aware of those that are listening, Congress recently passed legislation. They really felt they're putting the patient first, but medical debt that's less than $500 cannot be reported to credit reporting agencies now. Right. Um, and as we all know, our pro fees are typically less than that with our EDENM coding and billing. That's crippling us. That's sort of cutting us off at the kneecaps because now we don't have a mechanism to report these individuals if they're not paying their bills. Um, I understand that a lot of people are going into debt and bankruptcy because of medical debt, but it was not coming from the emergency department. Um, and so I almost feel we need to t think about legislation where we can carve out pro fees that aren't that high so that we, you know, to maintain our sustainability. But that is going to be catastrophic. And I see, I think as we see more and more data with that, patients are going to, they're not, they're not dumb. When you, when you Google it, it says, don't worry about making those debts. They, there's nothing they can do about it. That's devastating. Exactly. The, the, the patient has, there's, there's no incentive for the patient to pay you. And that's, you know, for us, um, you know, I'll give an example here in a minute. And Jamie, you hit on it, is this giant shift we've had from the professional fees to the hospital-based fees. I had a, a firefighter that came in, had a, had had a piece of metal in his finger for a long time and asked if I could take it out. And I said, yeah, sure, come on in, but I need to register you because I need a record and, you know, make this thing legit and never even got a bed, just brought him back a chair right behind triage, used the ultrasound, found it, little incision, pulled it out. Um, probably the entire process was 10 minutes max from the time he, he came in. And you know, about a month later, he says, Doc, I got your bill for $2,500. I said, what, is, what are you talking about? And, um, and I said, what, what's it say at the top? And you know, had him read it. I was like, oh wait, that's the facility fee you got, you don't have mine because my bill is going to be about $100 at most, if that. And not only was that facility fee just ginormous for not actually even having a space, but also then, as you guys mentioned, John, especially was the underinsured, how we've shifted the cost of the patients in a different way with these higher deductibles and shifting those costs to the patients that patients feel they have insurance. And in fact, my wife works for a clinic that was for people that did not have insurance. And then with the expansion of, with the Affordable Care Act, Kentucky was an expansion state. Everybody theoretically has insurance. And they thought, oh, we're gonna end up closing the uh, clinic down. And, and I said, no, you're gonna now have this huge influx of underinsured people that theoretically have insurance that they're paying for. And it's basically useless. Um, let's comment on that, on the fact that we have this, you know, when we talk about medical debt, but what's not talked about a lot is the fact that folks that are scraping or are check to check to get by are spending their money on this insurance that's basically an empty hull. There's nothing there, it's no coverage, it's just in name only that they have insurance. And as you guys both mentioned, potentially a catastrophic plan, which apparently insurance doesn't call, consider anything catastrophic because I had a, a, an acquaintance just recently diagnosed with terminal cancer and only had a catastrophic plan through their school and it's not going to cover anything. So, you know, it's kind of hit on that fact, the, the, the shifts as part of those games that they're playing. The challenge, I believe, from the insurance company, if you, if you take a moment and go back in time, uh, virtually all of the, uh, as the managed care era came upon us, it wasn't too long and, and that, that period was there were so many denials initially. Uh, ironically, many of them me are mirrored even to this day. But if you go back in time, you will see that the basically the majority or almost all of the major insurers in this country uh, had class action settlements against them. And emergency physicians were involved in, in a lot of those settlements. But the problem is you you assuming, well, and, and the physicians won many, millions of dollars. However, when you look at it, you then have physicians who are paid years after the fact for services they provided, 
But the other thing that's more devastating is the fact that from the insurance company's standpoint, those settlements, which were in the millions of dollars, are effectively no more than rounding errors on their statements. So they're similarly to, you know, when we said the patients today with Jamie, you mentioned about the, uh, the credit bureau issue and the lack of an incentive for the patients to pay, uh, you have the insurance companies and, and Dr. Sandy, you alluded to it uh, when we first started, you know, the billions of dollars in profits um, there, this is just effectively a game from, from their perspective. And there's a, a constant shift to drive down reimbursement. Jamie, you said that about um, the drive towards Medicare. Um, and Medicare has never been close to, to sustainable in terms of an adequate uh, system of reimbursement on the pro fee side. Yeah. It's it's devastating, you know, and uh, I'm preparing to go to the RUC uh, here in about a week in Chicago uh, to represent America, the ASAP at the table where we talk about RVU valuation. And um, there's a specific set of codes we're going to be talking about at this meeting, which at one point or another will get passed at some RVU valuation. And when they get approved by CMS, it's going to be a large uptick in the amount of money that needs to go into that pot. And so it's going to be a mandatory decrease in the physician fee schedule and an adjustment of the conversion factor. Okay. And so we, this isn't sustainable. We need to talk about physician reimbursement indexing to inflation. And I just a quick Google search last night, United health group in 2022 reported $20.6 billion in profit. That's after all their other expenses. That's because they're taking all these premiums and reinvesting in, the, in themselves Everybody goes up. We're, you know, my group, uh, we're actually switching insurers this year because we were with Cigna and they wanted a 27% increase in our premiums this year because we had one of our partners had a sick child that had open heart surgery and it impacted all of us. They said we were high risk to them now because they want nobody to have any claims is what it comes down to. It, it's simply unbelievable. And the other part that I find just, you know, I have a health insurance plan with a health savings account, which my wife, we find very good for us. But what's crazy about that is you're only eligible for an HSA if you have a high deductible plan, right? And so you can't have a health savings account, which helps you in your taxes uh, because they want you to be in my, my premiums for my family. I'm paying almost $25,000 a year for my family for health insurance and premiums. Um, and so something's got to give. I mean, this is just becoming unsustainable. Um, and, you know, and then it, it's frustrating as the rates go up, the insurers keep making record profits and then they keep trying to claw back more from us. Um, and so it, it's, it's multifaceted and I'm just concerned. We want to keep bring, attracting the, the, you know, the most uh, the educated and the vibrant to our specialty. And I, I think we're going to continue to do that, but we also need to have assurances to that the reimbursements are going to be there. They, they can pay back their student loans and continue taking care of patients and, and having a, a good lifestyle. But let's be honest, going through medical school and residency, there's a pretty large opportunity cost and you should have the benefits of a good career and income. And so, you know, we're fighting every day, uh, which we'll talk more about that too. But sometimes it's just all the fighting and all the oxygen that it takes just to maintain the status quo. It's just really unbelievable. So we're going to bounce right back into that, you know, because that's a good, great segue, Jamie. Um, what do we do? What's the, what are the solutions, the battle? And I actually don't see solutions. I don't necessarily see solutions because insurance is going to continue to do their reindeer games uh, in perpetuity until there's, I guess, as long as they exist. Um, so how do we, how do we address it? What do we do? How do we as physicians fight back when it seems that, you know, the hospitals want their piece, they're going to fight for their piece. They really don't care about what we do. Um, the insurers demonize physicians saying they're the ones, they're the reason it costs so much, uh, not us. Anytime we mention anything, they're like, oh, okay, we, but we have to go up on our rates. So it turns the public against us. You know, there's, it's, it's a tax from every angle. What do we do? I mean, I'm glad, Dr. Stanton, you, you brought this up because I, I, think, I think it's imperative. My incentive in, in any article that I've ever written or co-written with anyone, my incentive is really to, to be an advocate for, this, for the specialty. And I agree that there, this can't just be uh, sitting back and complaining. There are, Jamie, you're, you're going to rock in, a, in a, another week or so, as you said. You're engaged. You're... I think part of the issue is how do we engage the rank and file uh, in, in terms of understanding these issues? I think you hit on something earlier about when you made reference to uh, hospital, some hospitals, well, they'll open their own urgent care center. Okay. Are, 
or the emergency physician is the group engaged in those in those planning, uh, in, in that kind of planning and what what it might how it might impact the emergency department. I think there's uh, I think there's an issue with value based care. You know, depending on who you read and what you read today, value based care may or may not be the long range plan in this industry, but it, it's there. ASAP, I had the privilege of serving on the ASAP, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, alternative payment model uh, task force. I think it's I think it's important for the specialty to embrace whether or not they're going to move forward. I mean, that model exists within ASAP. Is it something that the specialty is going to engage uh, and move forward with? And, and that would mean initiating open dialogue with the insurance companies. You know, we've been talking about a fairly antagonistic relationship with the insurers, which certainly is accurate. But some of these possible solutions may involve an open negotiation, but I think it's imperative that the specialty initiates that. Uh, one other aspect I would suggest is worthy of, of consideration, and that is, does the specialty, do, the, do your individual groups engage the larger employers and become attractive to the larger employers for, to provide services to their employees. Uh, I think there are some groups that I'm aware of in, in the specialty that have done that, have actually just gone out to the employer groups and contracted with them as opposed to contracting with directly with the insurer, or I should say in addition to engaging with the insurer. I think those are all excellent points, John. And for me, I think that, um, you know, we had, we alluded to talk about the prudent layperson standard earlier. I think the whole uh, connotation of urgent care versus emergency department is something we, we need to change. I think that, uh, like I said, with so many complaints overlapping, it takes a, uh, this should be a physician-led team taking care of you, right? Um, every day that I work, I have many, many patients that are sent to me from the urgent cares um, that need a higher level of care, and some are just frankly not uh, diagnosed appropriately. And so, and again, we're not perfect, but we have the skills, we have the tools that we need. Let's not forget that most urgent cares aren't equipped with the imaging and the lab testing and things that we have. You know, if they can't do a rapid or point of care test, they usually can't do that. I think it's a disservice to our patients. And I'm, you know, those patients are important to our bottom line. Like I said, this is a business that we also need to maintain the sustainability. I think we need to talk to the American Hospital Association. These facility fees are getting out of hand. You know, now it's okay uh, for the emergency department to have all these patients that are boarding. And I had a, a colleague text me yesterday that she can't see any patients because they have 70 boarders in their department. And so that emergency department is pretty much crippled. They're not able to make any money because let's be honest, we're hourly and we, we work on the patients that we see unless you're a staff employee. Um, and so, but the hospital sees that as okay because the way the reimbursement is now, they make their money on their elective procedures and surgeries. Don't think they're going to reschedule the total knee or the open heart to get your patient upstairs. They're going to save that bed for the surgical patient making the money. We need to rethink how we're doing things. Boarding is a huge issue. I know the college, we have a whole task force on that, but that is certainly impacting our bottom line. And that may be uh, one of the integral parts of the triangle, in my opinion, of what could could be a, a catastrophic blow to the viability of our specialty. If we can't get these patients upstairs, we continue to see patients, they're going to seek care elsewhere. And I actually think it's going to put patient health at risk because they felt that they had to come to the emergency department and they're leaving. And let's be honest, when I look at the data for those that leave without being seen, they're often patients that have insurance that can pay us to be there and they have a choice, right? Those, those patients and God love them that don't have the ability, they're gonna wait as long as they need to wait to get taken care of. We're happy to do that. Uh, but they're not the ones that are typically leaving from the waiting room uh, to go elsewhere, it's other patients. And so there are so many different uh, components to this that we need to tackle. I also think that this also starts with what we did at Leadership and Advocacy in D.C. Very proud of the conversations we had on the Hill with our legislators um, to do with uh, indexing Medicare reimbursement to inflation. There's absolutely no reason why the hospitals get an index, but we do not. And as we can see, that line is just completely flat. And when, they, when our legislators see that line in their staff, they're completely floored that we that will continue doing what we do for those rates. Because on the Hill... Congress still sees us as the quote unquote rich doctors just asking for more. They need to understand we're here for your loved ones, but we're also being taxed with EMTALA um, and all of these other constraints that are sometimes out of our control uh, to make to make the bottom line. I think an undervalued gem uh, of the specialty that is 
frequently overlooked because you don't necessarily, be, you're not the admitting physician. However, the statistics are and, and, all, and have been for decades that you're effectively responsible for whatever it is, 70, 80% of the admissions to the hospital. But you, you, have, you really never get credit for that. And it's, it's never really part of, the, part of the messaging. But you're contributing, and not only are you contributing to such a high percentage of the, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the hospital admissions, you're contributing to all the downstream care by the referrals that you're making within the system. So let's spend the last few minutes here with the document documentation changes, because you guys, I got the experts here, might as well tap into that expertise. Um, I love the new documentation. I feel like it is much more uh, focused on the patient's presentation, uh, but of course we're seeing it being manipulated as well. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys have seen now that we're nine and a half months into uh, the new documentation guidelines. You know, uh, it's been interesting. Um, I think this is uh, not at all what the healthcare insurers wanted to see because this now is uh, letting us have more time with the patients and it's putting it all into the medical decision making. And we clearly know now what we need to do. Um, and we're actually seeing an uptick in reimbursement for most groups that have an RCM that's able to use AI and capture those things in the chart. What I really appreciate more that, you know, this is what I'm seeing now nine months in, as you asked, I really appreciate the social determinants of health component now because, you know, health equity is always a buzzword, but now we're actually talking about financial, food, home, uh, you know, uh, housing insecurity, and we can actually empower and do that. That actually was a trigger for us to include case management that helps with all that as part of our ED accreditation, which I think is going to be amazing to help these patients go forward with substance abuse and things and address those issues. As far as the dollars and cents go, 99281 is pretty much non-existent now, and that's actually part of our assumptions in this uh, article as well. But now we're seeing a shift from the threes to fours. Some of the fives went to fours, but we're seeing, if people are they're really looking at this now, we're seeing an uptick in critical care because we talked about our patients are much sicker. Um, and so I used to give a presentation on the old uh, Marshfield uh, car, uh, Clinic di guidelines, and there was a lot of different things they could talk about. Well, you didn't have enough HPI, or you didn't do a full review of systems or social, you know, social history. We're going to downgrade, you know, downcode this chart from a five to a four, or four to a three. Those targets are no longer the dartboard is no longer there. Now it's pretty concrete. Three columns, two points wherever you are, and you know it's low, medium, high complexity, and it's much easier to achieve with good documentation. And now we're actually getting rewarded for our cognition. If I don't order that CT scan on the kid because I applied PCARN, or I don't have to get a uh, CTEA of the chest because I did, applied a D-dimer or Wells criteria, I get credit for that now, whereas before we did not. And so it's making for better patient care, more time with the patient. I think it's really, really helping open our eyes to some health equity and making some more inroads for these patients because it's actually something that's in the forefront now. Um, and lots of groups uh, that I'm seeing that have good RCMs that are doing a good job are seeing an increase in their compensation. And so now we're going to see what kind of tactics the healthcare insurers are going to use to try to, to degrade that money as well, because we know it's coming. Um, but uh, I, I'm very excited about what this has been showing so far in the first nine months. I mean, I agree. I mean, I, I'm a layman. So I, I, what I pick up is what very similar to what you just said, Jamie. And, and what I have heard on numerous occasions is this system of documentation requirements really better reflects what you actually do for the patients as, as emergency physicians. I think what it is incumbent along that, those lines, though, is to make sure to continually monitor. Like, as you said, there's an increasingly higher levels of service increases in critical care. It, that really makes it imperative that, the practi that practices have the right reporting tools, sophisticated re reporting tools. I think one of the most salient factors that came out of COVID was the necessity of having predictive analytics, uh, to be able to project your, your cash, to be able to project your visits, and to have that information available to you 24-7. Uh, as the acuity mixes continue to, to change and shift, it becomes more and more important, not only from a financial standpoint, but it gets to the nuts and bolts of staffing and those kinds of issues in terms of uh, the patients there, that you're seeing today versus what you saw three years ago. Um, I, I think it'd be, it's a new era, if you will. We talked about several different aspects of the, this current era that we're in. 
but it's a continually evolving paradigm that we're in. And I think it's, it's imperative that emergency physicians stay on top of this and initiate things, initiate programs, initiate uh, potential solutions uh, and continue to bolster, bolster their position with the data and the analytics that's now hopefully more available to practices. Just quickly for the, you know, the MDM and all of this construct, you know, a shout out to ASAP because our own John, Dr. John Proctor, who serves with me on the Ruck, was one of the eight individuals that sat at the table to help come up with the EDENM guidelines. Um, so we had a voice there and also our CPT team. And so, you know, that was imperative that we actually had a, a seat at the table. We're the only emergency medicine specialty organization that has a permanent seat at the Ruck um, and also in CPT. And so uh, they really moved mountains because we, we made some changes there, you know, getting the credit for the parenteral antibiotics or the, you know, the benzodiazepines. That's all important to what we do to help level up our charts. You know, it feels like a video game, uh, but they were there and they had meaningful dialogue also working with the teams so that we could move the needle. Um, and so, again, that's another example of something that happens that people are just not really aware of, but we had a seat at the table to make this the best that we could for our specialty at the time. And that's what I like about it is, is the fact that it's the documentation is what you're actually doing as opposed to what we saw before, which was, you know, the whack-a-mole of, of making sure you check the right boxes that had nothing to do with the care and the patient in front of you. You know, it really is focusing on the stuff we already did. We just have to voice it. And that was the interesting thing was that ramping up. And you could definitely tell the difference in the groups that actually focused on it and got everybody prepared prior and those that did not uh, with the potential, you know, losses and then, you know, huge drop initially for some groups while others like like mine, because we did a lot of preparation, mainly because of people like you and, and Jason Adler and others that uh, came in and talked with us and we shared their in, the information. So we were ready and actually started to transition the charts months before, well, a couple of months before uh, in order to get ready. So as we wrap today, two asks of each of you, any closing thoughts and uh, any closing thoughts and then contact information. Go. Sure. I, I, you know, I thank you for this opportunity. I think that, um, you know, we, we are a part of the greatest specialty in medicine. There's no doubt. Um, but like I what I've learned throughout my career so far is that we work very hard and we should not be uh, ashamed to talk about the money that we make and that we're fighting for fair and adequate reimbursement. But it takes a village, um, and so I'd encourage everybody to continue uh, with the college and become get on committees to help us with this fight. Come to us at Leadership and Advocacy, where we talk to our legislators that can actually try to make moves at the federal level, get involved at your state level as well, because uh, everything everything's local, as we know. Um, you know, there there are challenges ahead, but there are many people that are dedicated to the specialty, and our colleagues fighting for each of us. Um, all of us on this call are part of that collective. Um, but it, it's uh, it's going to be a battle. It's it's we're clearly not where we need to be yet, but we're going to continue fighting every day. I just uh, first want to thank you both for this opportunity, uh, Jamie. It started with you and I co-writing this article, and thank you for that, Dr. Stanton. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's been a while that I've been involved with the specialty. I simply want to say that it continues to be. We talked about problems, we talked about issues, but it continues to be a very exciting time of opportunity for the, for the specialty of emergency medicine. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Your master diagno diagnosticians, as Jamie, as you said, you deserve to be reimbursed, you deserve to be paid fairly and paid timely. Uh, it is a continual time of change and innovation. It's a time to engage. It's a time for the rank and file to to understand the issues through ASAP, through, through a variety of different sources, but it's so imperative to engage and be able to, and to think and to be able to initiate different approaches to these, to these uh, issues and challenges that the specialty has today. In terms of contact information, uh, my phone is 610-715-2166. My email is the letter J, Holstein, H-O-L-S-T-E-I-N, at zotechpartners.com. It is truly a pleasure to have done this with you today. And Ryan, uh, my, my email is uh, jshoemaker, that's uh, J-S-H-O-E-M-A-K-E-R at asep.org. Happy to uh, have any dialogue. But again, uh, true pleasure being with you again on ASEP Frontline. And I appreciate both of you. And John, I apologize growing up in the South with family members, I turned I turned your last name into a bovine reference. So, um, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so John Holstein and Jamie Shoemaker, 
Um, and as Jamie mentioned with the Leadership and Advocacy Conference, the reason that it's important, the reason to show up, is I actually got the notification uh, yesterday uh, that two of the topics we talk about have directly led to legislation that's been filed, and one is on boarding, and one is on uh, violence uh, against uh, ED physicians and healthcare staff. So it does make a difference. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to pass. It doesn't mean it's going to go through. But it's making a movement. It makes wave. And eventually, that is what makes a difference. As for me, you can contact me, rstanton at asep.org, rstanton at asep.org, at Everyday Med on the X machine. And uh, until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASEP Frontline. If you're not on the front lines, you're on the sidelines. Cue the music. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. Quiet place. All yeah. alone. Da, da, da.